Shadow of the Erd Tree is finally here. Two years on from more than 25 million of us taking our first steps into the lands between, the next step in our adventure is finally in our hands. I recently had the opportunity to sit down with legendary game developer Hidetaki Miyazaki to discuss his latest masterpiece. Thank you so much for agreeing to meet with us today. Yes, quite. So, Elden Ring has been incredibly popular. How do you feel about all of the new players who fell in love with the world you created? I hate them! Yes, I suspected as much when you put the Tree Sentinel right at the start of the game. I noticed you did something quite similar here with the Fire Golem. What was going through your mind when you designed this enemy type? Well, that makes sense. One final question for you, sir. Is there anything you'd like to say to those who are saying the DLC is too hard? <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but my time in the Land of Shadow has been very special indeed. Miyazaki and his team really did break the mould when they made Elden Ring. It's not like Dark Souls and Bloodborne hadn't been popular or anything, but the level of success they achieved with the Lands Between was like nothing they had seen before. Even with From Software's already stellar reputation for producing exceptional DLC, this was still their first foray into the open-world Soulsborne hybrid genre. They had the unenviable task of trying to capture that lightning in a bottle again. And as far as I'm concerned, they did. You did. You crazy son of a bitch, you did. Join me today as we discuss how From Software brought home another 10 out of 10 masterpiece, despite the incredible ramp up in difficulty, and why Shadow of the Erd Tree is worth your time. So, first up, it feels like it's almost a legal requirement at this point to discuss the difficulty. Taken on its own, that statement is almost hilarious. It's a Souls game, of course it's difficult. My own mother knows that Souls games are difficult. Not because she's a gamer, she's just nice enough to watch my videos. Aww. When I started my journey in the Realm of Shadow, all I knew was that Fighting Cowboy said it was great, and you needed to look out for this skidoo tree? Skidoo tree? You know what, I think it's actually pronounced Shadow Tree. Huh, I see what they did there. Anyway, yes, the DLC blessings, because they make a big difference to your overall survivability. I confidently strolled into the gravesite plane, my 80 intelligence and 80 faith build, walking tall with a maxed out moonlight greatsword, and this was the first enemy I stopped to deal with. I mean, I knew it was going to be tough, but this really gave me pause. As I ventured a bit further in, I soon came face to face with the Black Jail Knight, and I was outright astonished at how hard a time I was having. I full on panicked over this guy. He never seemed to let up. He never seemed to have any problem reaching me. The damage I was inflicting was average at best, and I couldn't summon any help. I am a more than competent Souls player at this point, and I hadn't panicked like this since my very first journey in the Lands Between. And that's when it hit me. That's the point. Miyazaki and his team actually found a way to return everyone to the same baseline, and to force us all to play the DLC as it was intended. I'm going to talk about this in more detail later, but for now, to answer the question, do I think the DLC is too hard? No. No, I don't. Okay, okay, hear me out it really, really pushes you in some places, and there are some occasions where it definitely skirts the line between challenging and bullshit, but overall, I think they nailed it. I think the other side of this argument is that for many players, Elden Ring was their first Souls experience, just like it was with me. 
Now just because I became like a player possessed and promptly devoured the rest of the Souls catalogue, it doesn't mean everyone else did. So there's a decent chance that a lot of people were simply expecting more of the same content here, because they never had the pleasure of the Orphan of Koz. Miyazaki doesn't give you more of the same. He creates challenges specifically for those who have mastered the base game and all that it could throw at them. For the last two years, he has no doubt seen all the videos about builds that break the game. He'll have watched us all enter boss arenas, spam our buffs and summon our spirit friends, and one-shot his bosses. For the last two years, he has been plotting his revenge, thinking about how to challenge us beyond what we already know, and this is the result. It's almost a meme at this point to go all IGN and say a game made you feel like Batman or Spider-Man or whatever. But I don't care, because for all of my Souls experience, Shadow of the Earth Tree made me feel like it was my first time, just like Elden Ring was, and this included the full spectrum of emotions that came with that very first adventure. <laughs> I had genuinely forgotten what it was like. To step into an enormous open world and have absolutely no idea what I was doing. To come face to face with seemingly standard enemies who were more than capable of murdering me. To rush ahead, desperately seeking another site of grace, so I can stop and explore a bit without worrying too much about how far I have to run back when I die. Equally so. I had forgotten what it was like to not have the belief in myself that I could overcome the challenges before me. It had been a very long time since I had felt my heartbeat in my ears after a period of intense concentration on my part, swiftly rewarded with the You Died screen. The Black Jail Knight and the Dancing Beast boss were very confusing for me because I hadn't yet regained my confidence and I spammed magic on both of them and got lucky. On my very first playthrough of the base game, I started out as an astrologer, preferring to attack from a safe distance, and I kept this up until my confidence grew enough to experiment. This would mark the only time I ever started a new Soulsborne adventure with a pure caster build. Not because there's anything wrong with that, but because it's just not my preferred method to do things, and yet here I was, all over again, feeling like I was starting from scratch. Quick disclaimer. There is absolutely no wrong way to play these games. Whatever works for you, works for you. You know when you sometimes wish you could forget a game or a book or a movie and experience it for the first time again? Well, this is genuinely the closest I've ever come to that. And even if I hadn't ended up loving Shadow of the Earth Tree, I would still have respected it just for this. The Land of Shadow initially seems to be far more morose than its more brightly lit counterpart. Everywhere you look, you see ethereal gravestones, presumably one for each time the devs died to their own creations. The music matches the tone of what you hear in Stormvale Castle, the first legacy dungeon. It's like you're walking to the gallows, but just like the lands between, there is so much out there to find. I mean, just look at the Cerulean Coast. I don't care that a dragon is going to appear right there, or that in about 10 minutes I'm going to find a deeply f***ed up area with finger trees. Right here, in this moment, I'm blown away by how pretty it is. Just like before, you never know what you're going to find, or how dangerous an area is going to be. I mean yes, obviously. When you first saw the Lake of Rot, you knew it was going to be a pain, but when I first saw Leonia of the Lakes, I certainly never expected sniper lobsters. And then, there are the legacy dungeons. You might think it's going to be all castle ruins, but then you find the lava forges, and the prisons where the jar people are made, and a very respectable upgrade of the Grand Archive from Dark Souls 3. And even when it is castle ruins, you might just venture off the beaten path for that shiny over there, only to find a waterfall you can climb, that leads to a hidden back entrance into that same castle. 
Whilst the opening gravesite plane doesn't share the lush green and slightly less threatening landscape of Limgrave, Miyazaki and co have nonetheless crafted a world that is every bit as compelling. Despite the dangers posed by even the most innocuous of mobs, I can't stop moving forward, and equally as importantly, I don't want to. So now I'd like to tell you all about when I got my confidence back. For the first three hours or so, I made steady progress. I respect my character so I could use the armor I got from the Black Jail Knight. I pumped up my stats with the few Shadow Tree blessings I picked up, and I was doing okay. Then I met Rilana. Remember how I said Miyazaki has spent two years thinking of ways to counter every game-breaking strategy we came up with? Well, get ready to feel that in your very soul. If it's not Rilana, it'll be another boss. It will happen to you eventually. Rilana might let you summon in some help if you can get half a second, but don't think that means you can hang back and spam magic at her. For one thing, she'll divide her attention between you both, and for another, she'll do this. Her combos just go on forever, and that's all before the second phase when she turns her swords into individual weapons of night and flame. In response to all of this, I say, thank you Miyazaki. Seriously? Because this was my get good moment. Oh, I get it! When I first lived long enough to see Rolana enter her second phase, I had serious deja vu. She reminded me of the dancer of the Boreal Valley. A boss so ferocious that I was genuinely scared to fight her my first couple of times through Dark Souls 3. Whereas now, she's just another day at the office. In that moment, I knew I could do this. Strategy overcame panic, and eventually, I prevailed. But this was only my first half of recapturing the magic. Going back to my first playthrough again, things really changed for me when I found the Sword of Night and Flame. If you know, you know. And if you had it before the first patch, then you really know. For a caster build, this weapon was simply too incredible to pass up. However, both of the special attacks need you to be in range of your target, so I had to learn. The game forced me to learn, and it was my first real step into a much larger world. You know those super cool swords Rolana was using? Well, they're mine now. And they're easily at their most powerful when you dual wield them. This was counterintuitive for me because I've always preferred the sword and board approach to things. So here I was, again, unlearning what I have learned, being pushed to get better. Because exactly like the sword of Night and Flame before them, Rolana's twin blades were just too insanely powerfully good to pass up. I am a huge fan of innovation in video games, especially in the form of additional content like when Resident Evil Village returned with a third-person camera, or Assassin's Creed 3 let us explore an alternate timeline, or going back to the very early days of DLC, when Tomb Raider Underworld let us play as Lara's super-powered doppelganger. Elden Ring effectively has given us more of the same, but it's done it in such a way that you get that fresh experience again, despite probably having a character build that can stomp all over the base game. Quick example. Whilst there was some variety to the catacombs in the base game, most of them did start to feel a bit samey quite quickly. So this time, you get them with ceiling spike traps that you sometimes need to get on top of, or inside of, and they can very easily still catch you out. Also, remember the goblin things? Well, now they have cannons where their faces should be. Oh, and sometimes they get backed up by magic snipers. The catacombs now will definitely keep you on your toes. More generally speaking, you'll find that a lot of enemies are more aggressive now. Outside of mini-bosses and basic mobs, you'll sometimes find these sort of mid-tier enemies that are like mini-bosses without all the pageantry. And make no mistake, they will f*** you up if you give them half a breath to do so. Explore, and you will be rewarded. I cannot overstate how massive this world is and just how much there is for you to find. 
Shadow Tree Fragments and Revered Spirit Ashes will more than bring you and your spirit pals up to snuff. And upgrade materials are everywhere. They very clearly want you to try the new toys. And this brings me to all of that very sweet new loot. I've already waxed lyrical about my new Night and Flame Twin Blades, but have you seen the perfume bottles? How about those martial arts weapons though? Someone at From Software very clearly wanted their own answer to Tifa. Your exploration will be brutally punished and generously rewarded in equal measure, just like in the base game. But again, even rocking your own equivalent of my level 319 Omni Magic Badass, you will have to fight for every inch of that exploration, and the sense of reward you will feel is simply without equal. Miyazaki and his team have done it again. Despite its incredible size and the freedom of experimentation, and the truly, truly devastating, game-breaking character builds that the original Elden Ring permitted, From Software have managed to deliver a pure Souls experience that forces everyone to learn and advance in the same way, to experience the game as it was intended, and to truly savour those hard-won victories. So, is Shadow of the Earth Tree hard? Oh god, absolutely yes. Have I ever found it frustrating? Yes, again, absolutely. Drifted the grace of God, shadow, and death, in the embrace of Mesmer's flame. It is a very steep learning curve in the Land of Shadow. Even with my prior Souls expansion experience, I was not prepared for how hard this DLC would push me. Is Shadow of the Earth Tree worth it? Yes, it really, really is. And when my blood pressure returns to normal, I can't wait to see what Miyazaki has in store for us next. Tell me guys, what did you think of this DLC? Which bosses gave you the most trouble? What's your favourite new weapon or ability? Thank you as always for watching and supporting my channel. See you on the next one.